Full house. You know, I admire you. And, uh, and the opportunities you've had. I regret not sending Jack back east for school. I feel sometimes that we've robbed him of countless experiences, all of which you've had. But what you haven't had, however, is an education about this way of life. You'll miss more than weddings for cattle, my dear. If you give birth during calving season, it'll be a month before he sees his first child. If you give birth in the fall, it'll be even longer. You will stand knee-deep in mud to help a sick foal. You will drive wagons through blizzards with hay for cattle and hear them screaming their gratitude when you approach. And you will be free in a way that most people can barely conceive. Now, if this is not the life you want, you must tell the boy now. Because you have to want more than the boy. You have to want the life, too. Because in this life, there's no debating which is more important, the wedding or the cattle. It's always the cattle. Welcome to Pod Clubhouse's coverage of 1923, a prequel series to Yellowstone. This is Caroline. And this is Mike. Tonight we're discussing the series premiere of 1923, aptly called 1923. Tonight's episode was written by Taylor Sheridan. I think you guys might have heard of that guy. And was directed by Ben Richardson. Ben is well immersed in the Taylor universe, Caroline. He has worked uh, as a cinematographer and a director on 1883, as well as episodes of Yellowstone, Tulsa King, Mayor of Kingstown. He is in the Taylor universe. And we know that Taylor has people that, that he likes and he just keeps like bringing them back. He definitely is creating some sort of community of, of actors and, and creators and whatnot to uh margaret are you are you talking about margaret <laughs> i'm talking about lots of people Claire Jordan, <laughs> margaret he's a dreamer margaret exactly just a community note please join us on facebook in the yellowstone 1883 1923 and four sixes discussion and news group to discuss 1923 and this whole universe we're talking about of yellowstone shows there's so much that's going on in the sheridan brain huh if you haven't watched the episode you should pause this now go watch it and then come back because we're not going to do like a step by step recap we're going to talk about themes and characters and you'll hear about the episode you'll learn about it but we're not going to take you through scene by scene all right so we've got this 1923 which i was excited coming off of 1883 i was excited to jump into this universe because this time period is so rich with ideas and people and things and places and things that are just like growing up all around them i find it fascinating definitely the time period feels like a character unto itself a hundred percent. I mean, and I think most times when you see the 1920s, you're usually in Chicago or you're in New York. You're really getting uh, the, very flappery. Yes. Yes. You're getting a lot of roaring 20s. You're getting gangsters, the rise of Al Capone, prohibition. You're getting that right. That's how usually where you see the 20s. But the 20s were a, a big time for the non cities, for the rural areas of this country, because there was drought. There were, you know, locusts. These were like real things that were happening from the end of of the teens all the way into the 30s. I mean, you have Steinbeck's like Grapes of Wrath, right? That's about like the Dust Bowl that would dry up the entire like Southwest. More than 50% of all farmers in Montana lost their farms from like 1918 through like 1925. Wow. For a couple of reasons. One, drought and locusts, which were an absolute real thing, which we see in this episode. Man, when that locust was like those three locusts were sitting on Harrison Ford's body and he was like yeah. not flinching, it was really gross. Um, <laughs> it was. But the uh, the market for beef prices and sheep pricing and, and, and livestock collapsed because you had all of this product, all of these animals and World War One ending, the high demand dried up and so prices collapsed. And so it was a rough time to be a rancher and be a farmer in America at this time period. So I like that we're getting this view of the Roaring Twenties and not just flappers. 
when they were sitting around talking about what to do next, there was the the uh, sentiment that there has been no easy years. So when we say like these were rough times, like it was always rough times is what I think that Sheridan would want us to know. Right. Here's a little fact just to hit on it. So a drought hit um, Montana in 1917. Locusts came in 1918. Between 1921 and 1925, half of the farmers in Montana lost their farms. Of the 82,000 immigrants who came to Montana to homestead in the late 1800s with the Homestead Act that they passed, where they started giving out land, 70,000 had left before 1925. That's so, wild. You know, November 1918, World War One ends. The military no longer needs Montana wheat for the war effort. The cattle prices collapse as the nation's markets were flooded with wheat, grain, produce, and, and livestock. Farmers who had gone into debt to support the war effort now cannot make their bank payments. Homesteaders who had prided themselves on their gift and grit and determination and adaptability felt helpless against the onslaught. What would happen would hold against the wind, sun, locust, and disease. As one deeply disappointed homesteader named William Alexander wrote in his diary, quote, people are just walking around to save on funeral expenses. Yikes, that's harsh. Yeah, that's from the University of Montana. Well, I'll put the link to the article. There's a great article about this time period from uh, from the University of Montana. Where it's worth a read if you really want to immerse yourself in the challenges that these these people were facing, that these Duttons and, and everyone around them were facing. Well, and we expanded into not only just the ranchers' history and what they were going through, but also, obviously, the, the Native Americans, the indigenous people, what they were going through and the changes that were happening to their people. Um, and we got into that in this first episode, which which was a very difficult watch and something that they yeah. had touched upon and talked about. If you have watched Yellowstone, you know, there's definitely been discussions about this, but this was in our face, you know, abuse that was horrible. Yeah, I mean, residential schools are a part of our history and, and Canada's history that I think a lot of people actually don't know about. I didn't learn about residential schools when I was going to school in New York City. Like, that wasn't something that was on my curriculum that I learned about. I learned about it really more recently and, and shamefully because I, I actually like history. I'm a, I'm a student of history. This was like a real blank spot for me. And so learning about it because those those uh, mass graves were found in Canada a couple of years ago reignited it to the forefront. And that's where I learned about it. You and I I've talked about it. You you knew about it for a longer bit of time, but it's a really dark stain on this country and, and Canada's country and then how they treated the first people and the indigenous people, all in the name of westernizing those people for towards Western culture and civilization, quote unquote, making them civilized. It, it is a tough watch. And um, the actress who plays uh, Tiona Rainwater, her name is Amina Neves. She said in, in an interview that people are, are going to have a time or are going to have a hard time watching those scenes, but the truth needs to be told. And Taylor Sheridan has said in all of his shows, he really tries to represent the Native American experience as truthfully and honestly as possible as he can. And that's going to make people uncomfortable. And I, uh, this was for me, the hardest part of the episode for sure was watching those scenes. Absolutely. And I think it's also being kind of the least talked about, to be honest. Like there's a lot of conversation because we have these ultra famous leads with Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. I really feel like that that actually the the residential school plot line has been pretty quiet. You know, like people kind of talk a lot about what's going on with the rest of it. And then they're like, oh, yeah. And then they did, you know, bring up the residential schools. And it's like, that's because it's like so traumatic to discuss and to try to, you know, sit there and watch. But so important. I mean, if Taylor has shown us anything, it's that he has a commitment to show the gritty realness of what was happening during specific time periods. And, you know, I applaud him for that. And I'm glad that this story is being told, because like you said, so many people have no idea. And, you know, Canada is very conveniently left off uh, the list of people who, you know, are frown face when it comes to their treatment of, you know, the original people here. So it's great when you can start kind of being like, no, like open your eyes. Like this was bigger than just what was going on in America too. The idea of residential schools goes back hundreds of years. It was first, uh, it was really first put into, into use, I think in the 1700s, the late 1700s, but there were still residential schools. Now they had cleaned up a lot of the abuses in them or allegedly had cleaned up a lot of the abuses that were in them, but there were still residential schools operating into the early 21st century. This is not ancient history. These are things like the abuses were happening still in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. The the unmarked graves are still being found. These are not these are not ancient people that we're talking about. These are our grandparents aged people, great grandparents aged people that were being 
disappeared in Yellowstone parlance. They were being train stationed because of of the abuse and and torture that they were put under. It, it's something that needs to be told. It is you can't have just the good stuff, right? You have to if you're gonna if you're gonna approach something with some integrity and some honesty. I think it's important. Yes, it may not be comfortable popcorn entertainment. Grab your family around to see a, a young woman whipped, but I think it's necessary. Uh, and if you're gonna uh, tackle this top topic. I give them a lot of credit for tackling the topic and for bracing it up. It feels more honest because, I mean, when we look at, you know, we're going to assume that some of you guys are somewhat familiar with Yellowstone, then you kind of know the different factions. So in that case, it's great that they actually took the different groups and like brought them all back to 1923 and was like, where was everybody at that point? And they did the same in 1883. Like we saw, you know, what was going on with different groups at that point as well. We should say, actually, let me say that up front, just so there's no confusion. We're going to make references to Yellowstone. We're going to make references to 1883 because 1923 is a show on its own for sure. It is introducing a whole new cast that we've never seen before. But it is very much a bridge show. It is uh, it is a sequel to 1883 uh, in a very direct way, involving grown up versions of characters and themes that we were introduced there. And it is a very much a prequel to Yellowstone and to the Dutton family and the and the Broken Rock Reservation family and then the rain the the Native Americans on that on that reservation and now the Rainwater family and their ancestors. It would be disingenuous of us, I think, to talk about this show without referencing the connecting themes between those shows. So if you're a purist and don't want to be spoiled, then this may not be the podcast for you to listen to. There are things that need to be done. And I think there are choices that Taylor Sheridan and Ben Richardson are making in this show specifically because they connect to Yellowstone in the modern age and and look backwards to 1883. So let me ask you, Mike, because I have people who ask me all the time, like, hey, I know you watch Yellowstone. I know you watch 1883. Like, where do I jump in? Previous to last year, it was easy. I'm like, Yellowstone. <laughs> Because right? there's nothing right. else on. But now I'm like, well, I think you should watch 1883 first. And then I'm like, well, and then, you know, don't go right to Yellowstone. You should definitely watch 1923. But then I'm like, well, but there were things in Yellowstone where they had flashbacks all the way back to our 1883 character. So what would you tell someone? Like, should they start at 1883 and go through or should they be watching shows simultaneously? What do you think? I think now with the with the with 1923 starting, I think you should watch 1883. I think you should then watch Yellowstone and then watch 1923. Not because you can't watch 1923 on its own, but you're going to miss things that make the television experience rewarding because Yellowstone does look backwards. Anyone who's going through currently season five, they've spent probably about a quarter of the season in flashbacks, not this far back. Yeah, it's a show that remembers its past. And while timelines and some facts and figures are a little wonky, there are some continuity issues. I think it's important to watch Yellowstone in order to really appreciate what's going on here in 1923. I was wondering why premiere 1923 now in the middle of Yellowstone, right? Both on Sundays. Aren't you shooting them in the foot? Usually you see a show run and then the next show takes over when the show has had its finale. Why premiere 1923? And for the first one, they ran it on the Paramount Network directly after episode seven of Yellowstone. When I thought about it, it made sense because the themes that were happening in 2022 Yellowstone in episode seven were happening in the series premiere of 1923. How are we going to feed our cattle? Talking about lend lease issues, leasing land issues, talking about protecting the land and fighting for the land. These are themes that are happening in both of these episodes. You don't get a better connective tissue. I think part of Taylor's governing thought is that American ranching has been a backbone of this country or was a backbone of this country for a very long time. Their story hasn't been properly told, and I'm going to do that. And it's not a now thing. It's not a then thing. It's a through the era thing. It's through the ages thing. And it has always been. And so he's tell he's trying to tell a story, I think. I think these shows are all trying to tell a story, a love story, a love note to that way of life, to that cowboy way of life, to that ranching way of life. And so I think you get the most out of it by watching them all, because then you see the connective tissue. I, I think it's tough because I, like, I, I, my instinct is to want to go more chronological and be like 1883, 1923, and then, you know, pick up where, you know, the beginning of Yellowstone. I But I see your point entirely. Like, you would be missing out on so much. Now, this is a great 
I, it's weird to say even series, but like, how, what's even bigger than that? Like, we were just called the universe, right? This is a great universe of shows to watch and then go back and watch from the beginning again and be like, oh my gosh, look at all the different things that I'm picking up or all the parallels or all the different, you know, like we said, themes that, that go throughout. This is a great one to go back and forth, I think, between shows and find characters and find similarities. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the, P- the, the PR firm that actually handles the the PR for all of the Yellowstone shows, the tag they use is actually the Taylor Sheridan universe. So there is a connectivity very intentionally running through these shows. Let's jump into 1923 because this this universe could suck us under. <laughs> right, right, right. So I think we start with, just like we did in 1883, we start with a scene that I think starts in the future. I mean, they don't actually make that abundantly clear but by the fact that it's not talked about hey why did Kara shoot someone and then scream with a head wound uh, a head wound that she doesn't then have in the rest of the episode it makes me feel like we're getting a glimpse of the future which is interesting because then you start thinking about when is she wearing that blue house coat when is there going to be a, a flat build like Peaky Blinders hat guy running from her like how far in the future is this scene any any thoughts on that what did you think of this as the way that they open it watching Helen Mirror gun a guy down (laughs) it's cliche probably to say you know start off with a bang but i feel like that's what taylor loves to do so you know he wants to bring you in this and i think he needed to establish helen mirren as Kara Dutton as, you know, this woman who is tough, strong and could handle herself. And you needed to know that about her right away, because I think when we all looked at the casting, I was like, okay, I don't know that I ever think of Helen Mirren as a pioneer woman. You know, I don't know that I see her as that. I see her as so much more sophisticated and elegant and whatever. And so I feel like you really had to get gritty with her right away. Having that blood coming out of her head and everything, you're like, look, this is a different Helen Mirren than you usually see. So like buckle up because she's tough and she's going to get the job done. And I love that about her. I got to tell you, you know this Caroline, but I feel like I, I, I feel I feel like I would be keeping it from the listeners if I didn't say I have a gigantic crush on Helen Mirren. I think she is just the hottest bee's knees thing going. And I, I she's an older woman. Uh, I'm an increasingly older man. I think she is just very beautiful. I'm always mesmerized by her performances. I think she is a fantastic actor. I am always sucked into her roles. I thought I was going to have a real problem here, especially with the trailers. I had heard the accent, the the very kind of uh, severe Irish accent. I, I had some concerns that I was not going to be able to get past the Helen Mirrenness of it all, watching her play this Dutton. Same as I, I had to worry about Harrison Ford playing a Dutton. I, I really was worried that were they too big of stars to to transcend a character role like they're going to be playing on the show. I think this scene, like you said, I uh, I wholeheartedly agree. You needed to see her animalistically gunning someone down, having a conversation about heaven and hell and loading the gun and, and when it dry fires and then frantically loading it again before he can get his out. And you needed that scene because I think it immediately made you forget that it's Helen Mirren and made you think it was Cara Dutton. I, I think it was a really smart scene versus her having just, you know, the conversation with like Elizabeth, which I think episode theme wise was most important conversation in the episode describing the ranching life. This scene was needed to be like, this is not any Helen Mirren you think you know, right? This is this is a pioneer woman who is trying to protect herself and her family and her land. So very successful in that regard, because I think of the two of them, you brought up Harrison, um, of the two of them, I think Helen disappeared into the role more. Yes. She she really just morphed into Cara Dutton for me, and I was completely cool with with the casting and everything she was doing. I thought she killed it throughout this episode. I believed her. I believed that she had like tough calloused hands. I believed that she knew how to do ranching chores. I believed her, you know, that she was the wife of a rancher for so many years that she just like knew the rules of the world here. I believed it. She sold it to me. Harrison, I'm be honest with you, I had a little bit of a harder time. Yeah. And I don't know if it's things like him wearing the pure white hat that made it look like there was like a spotlight on the star in the middle, kind of like musical style Western. You know, the rumor is he tried on over 75 different hats to find the right one for Jacob Dutton. Well, I believe that. And now here's the thing. I, I, maybe they'll touch on this. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But that hat was so darn clean, so darn clean. And, and and we have such a great show with Beth Kushnick over um, on Hollywood to your home. The idea that he could be, 
be a, like a dirty hands-on rancher and have a pure white hat felt so off to me. Like it felt like, you know, we talk all the time on the other podcast with Beth about like patina and aging and having things look like worn in and everything. And I was like, that looks like you just got that hat out of the box. You know, like it looks so off-putting to me. And I'm, I'm a Texan. So I was like looking at this, like, this is not what men's hats look like. You know, every single time their hand goes up to touch the top of the hat to take it off, it would get dirty. And so there was like all these parts parts to the introduction to him where I was like, man, please, please start kind of blending into the group. Like, I I need you to be like the strong leading man and also seem like you're actually in this world, not like you're just like, you know, enter stage right and onto the stage and you're going to sing your big song and then leave. You know, I need you to look like you're part of the entire group. Now, I have to say, having watched the 1923 La Monica Garrett hosted behind the scenes, there were a couple little scenes where we actually saw more action out of Harrison, Mm -hmm. where he was like shooting a gun or like laying down behind a log and doing other stuff. Now, those things, they weren't so Hollywood cowboy looking. Does that make sense? Right. Like, yeah. Right. As opposed to like, you know what I mean when I'm talking right, about like, like he's going to pull cowboy... a, guitar off, a guitar off his back and yes. sing, a, sing a Ponderosa song. Yeah. Yes. I don't want white chaps with rhinestones on them. You know, yeah, it... I need him to be that gritty. Now, Harrison himself, of course, is a great actor. He had some signature Harrison Ford smirks that he pulled in this episode that I laughed at. Um, anytime he made a joke, he kind of was like a <clears throat> kind of thing at the end of it. And I loved all that stuff he i think is going to grow on me but the initial casting for this i was like i can't unsee the fact that harrison ford is on a tv set right now my single biggest worry about the show was him being cast as the patriarch of this time period because i find helen mirren i think of more as a character actor who does different roles harrison ford is han solo he is indiana jones and now you're telling me he's a paramount network tv star i think it was a lot more successful than i was worried about I was more lost in him in the role than I thought I was going to be. And I agree with you. I think he will grow up, grow on me. Harrison Ford has a, has a reputation as being a bit of a grumpy Gus um, in real life. I, I've never met him. I've never interviewed him. But I know his reputation in real life is is a little cantankerous. And there are scenes in this episode where you get like real, like angry grandpa kind of vibes. But I think it generally worked as a guy who is hardened. Right? He's been here since 1894. It's now 1923, you know, 29 years he's been here. And I think you can, I think he sells well enough. He's tired. He's tired of never having an easy year in the 29 years he's been here. When you talk about Harrison Ford moments that really like, he could read you like the phone book and you'd be into it. There was this line he has when he's talking to Banner during the, at the end of the livestock uh, uh, meeting. We're all bunched together here. Fighting for every blade of grass, while you have a whole mountain range to yourself. You have the land, you have the lease, you have everything. I have what my family fought for. You want to fight me for it too? I didn't think so. He doesn't even give him time to answer. He's like, no, I didn't think so. That's a Harrison Ford is about to pull out like a gun or a blaster or a six shooter and like shoot someone. I like that. Those kinds of moments brought me into the role, of, uh, you know, a bit. I didn't actually notice his hat, but the fact that you're talking about it the way you are is interesting to me because I have noticed in Yellowstone this season, go take a look at Casey Dutton's hat. Is that Luke Grimes plays Casey? Look at the hat he's wearing. Caroline, it is so worn from the weather. It looks like it's about to start punching holes in it. Like just yeah. it's it's evaporating. But it is so worn in. Right. And I <laughs> and I had noticed it and I was like, man, they need to get this guy like a new hat. Like it is it is so worn by the elements. It looks like acid rain has been falling on this hat. Like the leather is like the 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 not leather, the um like the lining, the kind of like furish lining on it is like warped away in places. It looks like this guy does nothing but work outside 
19 hours a day and and his hat shows it and i've noticed that about casey and i was like well that fits with his character so it's interesting when you contrast these two guys like these are both ranchers these are both guys who are working outside with their hands what what does that that ever clean hat mean is it just a metaphor that he is so beyond reproach his soul is so pure it can't even even his white hat can't be besmirched <laughs> maybe perhaps uh you know maybe also to, and to be clear it's not white it's just super light it's like light tan but 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 for all intents and purposes, you know, maybe they shied away from a darker brown hat because of him playing Indiana Jones and they didn't want it to look mm. like that. You know, it's possible. Obviously, he's a good guy. Good guys are always going to wear the lighter colored hats and stuff. I think also, I mean, we can see, you know, he's the commissioner, right? There is like these portions of it that maybe he's a little more of a businessman. And so in that case, their hats are not going to look like how you were describing Casey's, right? right. Like they're going to look like he goes to an office. I, 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 you would imagine he actually has two hats, right? He has his ranching hat, you I would imagine. imagine. so. And like a town hat. Right. Maybe. And I think even John Dutton, I think even Kevin Costner's character has different hats he wears, depending whether it's a formal function like being sworn in and governor. That was a pretty clean hat, that dark hat he was wearing when he took his oath as oh, governor. Yeah. And I'm sure it's a part of the normal it's like the kind of tie hygiene you wear. of it all would be to yeah. like clean it and take care of it and, you know, do whatever you need to do to take care of it. I Like for me, like, and I don't want to get stuck on this because I don't want, I don't want listeners to be like, it's not white, it's tan and bubble. Like, I don't, yes, right. you're correct. Please don't do that. <laughs> the point of it was that I didn't want him to come off like a Hollywood cowboy. I wanted him to come off very... You're not looking for a Roy Rogers no, or like a... Like I, a I'm right. looking for someone rugged and very believable that he lives in this world. Now, you know, one of the things that, that stuck out that I applaud the casting is I appreciate that Jacob Dutton and Kara Dutton are roughly the same age and the same era, mm -hmm. right? Because old Harrison Ford's not known for that. I think that that's wonderful that they didn't make him have like a super young wife or anything like that she is his contemporary and you can tell the scene when they're laying in bed together and they're talking and stuff there is a real like we're peers you know we're partners we're equals you don't get that you know oh he's the authority figure and like she has to like listen to everything like no they they are like in this together and that was very heartwarming to me that really that was very well sold to me weddings in a week jake does that mean you won't be there Nobody can be there. The whole valley is pushing cattle. Oh. Well, I'll talk to the girl's mother tomorrow. I don't see what harm two weeks would do. Jack said he'd handle that. Okay, Jacob. It's his wedding. The wedding's for the woman, Jake. If it were for men, we would have spat on our hands and shook on it, and then you would have bent me over the first thing you could find that would hold our weight. Not far from how it happened, honey. <laughs> This is where, especially Harrison Ford shine for me in this episode was the chemistry he has uh, that Harrison Ford and Helen Beeren have together. I found their chemistry to be wonderful, believable. This felt like a couple, a couple that has been married for decades. I love that they have the history together as having acted together as a husband and wife in Mosquito Coast. And like how when interviewed Helen Mirren was like, yeah, it just seems like, you know, 40 years later, you know, and he's still my husband kind of thing, you know, like right. that was very right. cool. And like you could kind of feel that longevity of their relationship. A hundred percent. I think that really transcended the screen and was a great bit. I didn't remember the Mosquito Coast connection until after I watched it. And I was like, oh, OK, so their chemistry really does go back for forever where they play. A, uh, they've played a married couple before this is not new for them they have been they have been attached in some way for a long period of time really really like that that scene in particular i i think everyone really liked the the you know bending over and, and hold my weight kind of thing but i think it did more than that i think it endears you to these two the, those kinds of scenes those kinds of moments where he's not belittling her they are being treated like equals he recognizes that she's a woman who could go out and shoot a guy down in the woods kind of thing like there is a mutual respect here. I like that we see her in the scene right before he comes to bed. We see her on the porch 
counting the heads that are coming back, you know, from the from the long horse trail uh, from Bozeman back to Paradise Valley. You see her counting like their heads. How many are there are the right number of men coming home to the house, but doesn't wait for them. She's not waiting on the porch. Then she goes inside and she can go to bed and rest. I like that because, again, it's part of this like she understands ranchers go out and they're gone for a period of time and then they come home and you can't there's only so much you can worry about it. Right. She tries to explain this to Emma towards the end of the episode um uh, john dutton senior his his wife you know she explains like when they say a week they mean two you can't you can't sit there you can, all you do is we got to run the ranch we got to do the work while they're gone we can't wait up but she is waiting up but she's not letting them know she's waiting up right yeah. she, she's waiting for him in bed she's not waiting for him on the porch and i think that's part of the relationship and the give and take and the equals in the experience, like you, you see the wisdom in her. You see that she, yes. she, she wants her heart to be settled enough to go to bed. So she counts the heads, but then she's like, that's all they need to know. They don't need to know I'm sitting out here. I'm like, I'm not a worry wart. Like I just need to know that much. And then my heart is cool and I can go to bed. Um, and so she's, she's just got that. I've lived this a thousand times experience feel for those nerds out there that like to keep track of such things. Uh, Bozeman to Paradise Valley, Montana is 28 miles. If you were to walk it, it would take you about 11 hours. So horseback riding it, it's probably less than 11 hours, but probably uh, not quick, not nearly as fast as a car. Uh, or it's interesting that it's daylight when they're having the you know livestock commission meeting in Bozeman, and then. Uh, it's very much nightfall when they arrive home and that she had sent the boys out to make sure he got home. Remember, she she comes up to Zane and, and Jack and the, when they're uh, breaking in that horse in the ring to go out on the road and meet them. I like that. Those are just little details. They didn't need to throw any of that in. But it really just, again, it sets you in the place that, yes, there are people in Bozeman who have co- who have cars. They have like their Model A's or whatever. The real Montanans here are still getting everywhere, either by horse and buggy or just by horseback. Um, so I thought that was like a nice little detail that they threw in, that it would be so dark after a 28-mile uh, horse ride home. Let's get into some of our other characters. This was a twist that it turns out to be uh, Uncle Jacob, who's actually coming into the family line here, because we didn't really know that. We didn't know exactly how this was going to go down. Right. And I do have to ask you, how do you feel about how they treated old Margaret? Well, we, we said at the beginning of this episode... This pilot episode on 823 was much more than about introducing plot, I think was meant to introduce the time period and the players and to connect us to 1883. I think more than anything, it was meant to tell us what has happened in the 29 years or the 30 years, uh, the 30 years rather since 1883 ended. So uh, let's listen to a familiar voice catch us up a little bit. My father had three children. Only one would live to see their own children grow. Only one would carry the fate of this family through the Depression and every other hail the 20th century hurled at them. Upon my father's death, my mother wrote to his brother, begging that he bring his family to this wild land and save hers. A year later, he arrived to find my mother frozen in a snowdrift. Her two boys half-starved and barely able to speak. He raised them as his own and took my father's dream and made it into an empire. Then the empire crumbled. So that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. There is catch-up information about how did we get here, and then there's future prognosticating info that we don't understand quite how it will play out in the future. Isabel May returning. Isabel May in the credits, which makes me think that she is going to be an ongoing narrator. She played Elsa Dutton in 1883. She, uh, spoilers, she dies at the end of 1883. She is the first grave of of, uh, the Yellowstone Ranch. Well, see, to that point, I don't really appreciate the fact that she was the narrator for this because there are far too many people out there who always have to have a little bit of like this, yeah, but... 
And the yeah, but is people don't want Elsa to have been di- to have been killed, right? To have died. Mm-hmm. So when you make her the narrator of the next show, you unfortunately fuel some fire of those conspiracy theorists, people who are like, no, no, she didn't really die. See, she's like, she's telling the story. See, and you're like, oh, no. I don't think any rational person really thinks that. One, they've shown her grave on Yellowstone. James Morgan and Elsa's graves have all been seen actually this season on Yellowstone. Um, I think she very clearly dies, but I think they introduced this concept of she lives on in spirit even in 1883. Remember, we had a whole conversation about the hummingbird, I think it was, that visits Shay on the beach right before Shay kills himself at the end of 1883. And, and spoilers. You, spoilers. <laughs> I said earlier, I said earlier, don't, don't listen. We we're going to talk about it. Because you have to. And if I sit here and go, spoiler alert, it's going to make this a five-hour podcast. Um, but there was this whole, we had this whole conversation, you and I, you should, guys should go back and listen to our 1883 podcast. We don't do the main show. Sheila and Steph handle main main feed Yellowstone, but Carolyn and I have taken over the, the origin story shows. We had this conversation about the idea that her spirit was still flitting around because she had made a promise to visit Shay on the beach or or that she would be with him on the beach in some way when he reconnected to, uh, when he got to the beach, which was his wife's, which was a promise he had made to his uh, then dead wife. And Desperate Housewives. Desperate Housewives in the 90s introduced this concept of the beyond the grave narrator looking down on friends and family and saying what they've been doing uh, since. Now, that was kind of like a murder mystery, uh, the way they set it up. Right. And this is a little different because you have the person live and then dead. Right, but isn't but that continuing a, to be the narrator? But isn't that a Yellowstone theme? The idea of our ancestors are with us. The amount of times that the people who came before are mentioned in in Yellowstone is increasingly present in the show. It, it it was always there. The one of the very first shots in the first episode is a panning camera shot through the graveyard, through the cemetery at the ranch. Uh the show from the get-go has always been about those who came before are are part of who we are today. I think a lot of people are gonna have interesting feelings about whether or not Elsa was the right person to bring her back. One, I think practically Paramount loved Isabel May. I think they were very upset that Taylor killed her in 1883. I think he almost had to bring her back in some capacity because she was such a steal, such a find for them in in that breakout role. I think he almost had to find a way to bring her back. I think that's a behind the scenes, non-story reason for doing it. But I always envisioned these shows starting with John sitting like Tate down in Yellowstone or or Beth or Casey, you know, in that beautiful f- living room that they have at the ranch and saying, let me tell you a story about how we got here. I In my head, I always, that's always how I thought these shows started, that they are the recollection of John Dutton in the present telling the story and passing on the history. So Isabel May coming back and, and Elsa narrating is that version of that. Let me tell you what happened to this family. I know the story. Now I'm going to show it to you. So from that point of view, it's in line with how I see the story as time is just a river. These are all just one large story at different parts on the same river. So I like the connectivity of it. So See, and I don't think it would have taken anything away from the story had they had Helen Mirren pick up the narration right at the beginning of 1923 and just pick up with that. Because what you just said is John would be the Yellowstone narrator. Why John? Why not Elsa? Because that wouldn't make any sense and we would feel weird. And so I feel right. a little like Elsa should have stayed in her time. She was a great character and she, was, she uh, Isabel May is a great actress. But at the same time, I think the story baton needed to be passed. And I think it's confusing to have dead characters be the narrators. Especially I if you haven't watched 1883. No if you haven't watched 1883, especially, who is this woman? Who is this voice? I don't who recognize that voice. Woman? I yeah, don't recognize this voice in the show. And right. there's going to be people who are hooked into 1983. 23 because of Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. The idea that like, oh, well, I didn't watch 1883. I just picked up with 1923. I could see that happening. For me, especially because Helen later does narration, I don't know that that needed to be the way. It was an interesting creative choice. It certainly did bridge the bridge that, you know, from the 1883 family to the 1923 family. But again, I'm going to stop you. What did you think about Margaret getting three words 
Margaret's frozen, dead in the snowdrift. That's it. That's where Faith Hill's character just peters out. <laughs> a, a little, a little disrespectful to the memory of it. I would have liked to have seen her being more part of building the Yellowstone dream, but. But 1883, Montana, Yellowstone, Paradise Valley, that was never Margaret's dream. That was always her husband James's dream. It was his idea. It was his plan to bring them there. And she went along with it because she believed in him. She never, she, we never saw that she fully believed in Paradise Valley. She believed in James, who believed in Paradise Valley. Yeah, but still, I mean, this woman, maybe that's how she starts in 1883, but she grows into a frontiers woman, right? She, she's got her chops. So it feels like, ah. Uh... She is a strong pioneer woman who could, the same way we're talking about how, how Kara and Jacob are a match because they are both capable ranchers. Margaret was as capable, if not more, than James Dutton in 1883. So for her to lose her way so much so that presumably was out foraging for food during the winter that we see. And uh, so let's... I think I feel like we need to give a little explanation, and especially for people who haven't seen 1883 or the flashback episodes of 1883 from Yellowstone from season four. There is a flashback in Yellowstone season four where it's 1893, 10 years at 10 years following 1883. James uh, Tim McGraw is a sheriff and livestock commissioner guy in Montana, a a fledgling Yellowstone compound. It's just a little cabin at that point. In the midst of hunting some poachers, some horse thieves down, gets shot. He makes his way back to the little Yellowstone ranch cabin. Margaret opens the door. Faith Hill's character, Margaret, opens the door. The door, she brings him inside. He He's trying to downplay how bad it is, but we hear the door closes. We're still outside, and we hear her emit a blood-curdling scream. In that same episode, before all of that, we saw Margaret at dinner with a, now a 15-year-old John Dutton and a little boy or a younger boy named Spencer. Spencer was not a character in 1883 at all, but in 1883, there were two Dutton children. There was Elsa, who was 17, 18 years old, depending on which episode you were watching of 1883. And then there was five-year-old John. Now, 10 years later, he's 15. There is a, now a new son, presumably Margaret and, and James had an additional child. And so there were two boys, John, who was 15, Spencer, who I would have put at like eight or nine. I feel like in at that 1883 episode, he couldn't have been more than 10 because he wasn't alive at the end of 1883 and it's 1883 so put him in the seven eight nine year old range in 1893 those are the two boys and we see them now as adult men in 1923 we learned from this flashback voiceover presumably james did not recover from that gunshot wound because that's 1893 margaret writes a letter to jacob dutton harrison ford's character says please come here my family is going to die. This could be a life. We we have, we want to, I want to fulfill James's vision for what this place could be. He arrives in 1894. So in that interim, it had to be, it was wintertime when uh, James was killed also, if I remember the flashback correctly. So in the interim, Margaret must have been trying to, you know, feed the family and actually get the food and forage the food in addition to raising the boys, dies in a snowbank. Now, a heroic death because she could have, she, she, she didn't die huddled under a blanket whimpering. She, she went out and did it and any man could have easily as died in the Montana winters, which are brutal, but it feels a little disrespectful for her not to have had overlap to Kara and Jacob arriving with their family. Well, what family? They only arrive. They don't have kids of their own, as far as we know, um, as far as we've been told anyway. There's only Kara and Jacob. So Kara and Jacob arrived. I would have liked to have known that Margaret was still alive, not dead like a popsicle in the snowbank. I agree with you. I think it's a little disrespectful to the kind of badass pioneer woman uh, that they established in 1883. It was just such little fanfare. And I know that that's part of this entire point of the story is that, you know, humans are fragile they come and go on this show you know people die that's and it's part a hard of it. life it's, it's people- a very hard life 
But man, I as the second they just said that one line, Margaret was frozen in the snowdrift. I was like, oh, that one was done dirty, man. Like that was that wasn't a heroic death. That was just went out with a whimper, man. Like oof, that just hurt. It hurt me. So, uh, I know we're jumping a little bit all over the place here, but let's talk family tree wise. Uh, let's because I think this is where a lot of people are invested in the story. They're invested in the where does 1923 take place in the in the in the Yellowstone overall larger Yellowstone story where are we in the family tree so you have james badge dale playing john dutton senior in 1923 he doesn't have a lot of he only has a few lines he's in a lot of scenes he is harrison ford jacob dutton he's his right hand man he's in virtually every single scene that jacob is in you see john dutton who's being credited as john dutton senior is there also but James Badge Dale and his wife, Emma, or John Dutton Sr. and his wife, Emma, who's played by Marley Shelton, are not part of the regular cast members. They are listed in the guest starring uh, credits at the end of the episode. So they are not regular cast, which tells me a couple things. It tells me they may not be on the show for very long. Remember Elsa's voiceover where she says only one child, one of the three child, that's Elsa, James, uh, Elsa, John and Spencer. Only one would live to see their children grow. And we know it's not Elsa. Spencer, as far as we know at this point, doesn't have children. So only only John has one child. He has Jack Dutton. That either means that John Dutton Sr. and Emma don't make it. And that's why they're guest stars and not regular cast members. Or it's just very much not going to be their story. They're just going to be characters in the background, like one of the bunkhouse boys on Yellowstone or like uh, uh, Linnell. Uh, on Yellowstone, who who is in a lot of episodes. You see them a lot, but it's not their story. They're just background characters. But like Robert Patrick, the sheriff, is in the regular cast. So we're going to see the sheriff, presumably, and know more about his story than John Dutton, who was in 1883. The character was in 1883 and is still there in 1923. But we're not going to know a lot about his story, I guess. I don't know if you have any thoughts, but we are going to learn about his brother Spencer who is like third build in the show Spencer being played by Brendan Sklenar he is a regular cast member do you have guesses here I know I know we don't want to uh, make a lot of broad guesses here but just based on those fact patterns and what we learned I mean, in this episode see I don't know I so to me I thought the death was going to be Jack like because he is the one that is you know due to get married and and I feel like when Kara says what difference does two week two weeks make you know like it's it's not that big of a deal that like like just clanged to the floor for me like right. Everything could change in two weeks, you know, yeah. and I think it will. So I don't know. And also having watched 1883, I don't think that young love, you know, makes it very long in these stories. And so I felt really like I zoomed in on Jack as the death. Now, are you zooming in on John as the potential death? Well, only one makes it to see their children grown. Well, Jack's already grown. Jack's, Jack's grown. That's true. And only one, but only one sees it through the strife that would come in the... Uh, remember, we're just in 1923, so we haven't even gotten to the Great Depression yet. We haven't gotten to World War II yet. Well, either Spencer or John don't make it that far, right? Only one sees the family through those through those moments that the 20th century would throw at them. Well, so who do you think? Do you want to throw down? Is it Spencer or John? That moves the family ahead it's episode one what do you think i think it's spencer and i also think you're right that it's jack who dies before the season is out but i'm gonna make a grand prediction this is how i see it playing out well first i gotta play a clip from 1883 i appreciate how patient you're being with my uh, beautiful jumbled mind here going all over the place <laughs> this is from uh, this is from the season finale or series finale of 1883 let's take a listen i know a place for you you go through that pass and you follow the river south. Yeah. I used to hunt that valley as a boy. And the winters are cruel, but the summers are rich and a man who plans can thrive. And you look like a man who plans. What's the valley called? I don't know the word in your language, but it's, uh, when you die, you, uh, you go there. Heaven. No, there's another word. It's not it. 
Paradise. Yes. Paradise, yeah. Good name. But you know this, that in seven generations, my people will rise up and take it back from you. In seven generations, you can have it. Someday, my family might seek to hunt that valley. And if they do, you remember me. And you let them. Your family can hunt day or get there and every day after. Good. So I played all of that because of the seventh generation aspect of it. You and I spent a lot of time with this. We were doing the math in 1883, Caroline, that it worked out that Tate made sense as seventh generation. And Tate being half uh, Native American and half Dutton made sense thematically that he would be the one to unite the ranch back to the land, right? This idea that the land will revert to the, well, in Yellowstone is the Broken Rock Reservation people, which is a confederation of, of different tribes. For the se- for Tate to be the seventh generation, Jack has to be the one who is the line progenitor. Here's the math. One is Tim McGraw, James Dutton. Two is John Dutton, who's a little boy in 1883 and is uh, 40 years old, 45 years old. 1883, it's been 40 years since he was five. So yeah, he's 45 years old, is the one played by James Badge Daly. He's two. Three is Jack Dutton, who's played by Darren Mann. Four is Dabney Coleman, John Dutton, who we only got to know in Yellowstone as a very old man. He is the father of Kevin Costner, John Dutton. So you have, I lost my count. So you have James 1, John 2, played by James Badgedale. 3 is Jack Dutton in this show. 4 is Dabney Coleman, uh, John Dutton. Kevin Costner, is John Dutton, is 5. His son, Casey, is 6th generation. Casey's son, Tate, is the 7th generation. But I agree with you. The show does not like young love. It does not like its characters living to ripe old ages. I don't see Jack making it out. So I think the show plants foreshadowing in the conversation between Jacob and Elizabeth Strafford's father, Bob. Elizabeth Strafford is played by Michelle Randolph. She's the one who's supposed to marry Jack Dutton. There is a conversation they have while they're watching their kids in the distance hug and kiss and spin that... Don't check the math too quickly when that first baby comes because you may not like the answer. I think Jack is going to die. I think Elizabeth is already pregnant. I think she's going to give birth to Dabney Coleman, John Dutton. And I think Spencer will become the de facto father of that young John Dutton in the same way Jacob Dutton, Harrison Ford, became the de facto father for John and Spencer Dutton. I think all of that makes quite a bit of sense with the amount of overall Taylor universe, um, the adoption of like a young fatherless boy. Uh, That is a theme that we won't delve into because we don't want to spoil things for you guys, but absolutely carries across all these shows. Yes. The, the idea of you don't have to be the biological father to raise, to raise a man. That family is, blood is important, but it's also kind of also how you choose it and how you put it together. And, and they're introducing the theme here of Jacob having raised a 15 year old John into manhood uh, for the last 29 years, serving as his father. And an even younger Spencer, who we said couldn't have been more than 10, so it was probably in the 7, 8, 9 range, probably has very few memories of Tim McGraw, James Dutton, as his father, and probably really only knows Jacob Dutton, Harrison Ford, as his father. The idea that it would be Spencer to carry forward, not having his own child, but raising his nephew very much in the Taylor Sheridan ethos 
the way he has set up these shows across all of the shows. You and I talked way back in 1883 that we thought it would be Spencer who would name his son John. This was our prediction back in 1883. Spencer would have a child, name him John in honor of his, at that point, then deceased brother. And that would be how you get to John Dutton, that the John Dutton being named John Dutton was too easy. Now, the show is not doing anyone any favors because of all the Johns and Jacks and Jacobs. So you have James's <laughs> at James's. So you have James Badgedale playing John Dutton Sr. That's how it's credited. The character is credited. Even they add the senior in the credits. His son, Jack Dutton, played by Darren Mann. Now, there are people who name their kids Jack <laughs> uh, and not as a short name for John. But often John, Jack is a nickname for Jack, uh, for John. So is Jack Dutton actually John Dutton Jr.? Which would make then his child John Dutton the third, the Dabney Coleman? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really I, it exactly doesn't, matter, right? It, do, it doesn't exactly matter, but it matters if his name is actually Jack or somehow different than his father's name, such that he's not a junior, because then the John Duttonness would start over again with with the Dabney Coleman John Dutton. Right, because if there's a break in it, then you don't you don't skip it. You just you just start over, and then that baby would then become John Dutton, and then would become John Dutton Senior. Well, something we can pay attention to. I mean, obviously, you know, we in theory would see this baby be born. So we'll see what Elizabeth, what happens with Elizabeth and Spencer, perhaps. Right, and you have that. You have Kara's narrated letter at the end where she says, "I hope you find the part of you that's missing, and you come home to us." Well, what thing to make a brother come home? more than the need to maybe raise his nephew's child. Well, and Taylor loves patterns. So, I mean, that's the exact same pattern as Margaret writing to Jacob and asking him to come raise your brother's children. I like um, it. And come help us. So, I mean, I see this all happening. It plays out very nicely. And frankly, it is the way that families work. Like, we talk about this a lot. Like, there's families who, you know, take in their elderly, and that's just, like, the thing, how it works. Like, their grandma comes and lives with them, and that's just the way it goes for every generation after that and there's other ones who don't do it that way um and so i feel like to find a pattern in a family it might seem like oh well, that's like a storytelling device but it's like no families are like that families actually do completely you know follow whatever the generation before them did what first impressions of jack dutton again played by darren mann and elizabeth strafford his betrothed uh, played by michelle randolph super duper young they felt very naive and very innocent and uh just that in taylor's universe that is ripe for cutting down <laughs> that is ripe for you need to have some sort of horrible life lesson come screaming at your face and that's what elizabeth and jack feel like to me like you two are just sitting ducks waiting to get some life shoved down your throat and i think it's gonna happen hardcore I think it was an interesting detail to learn that Elizabeth had been schooled back in the East and, and Kara, I don't know, out of trying to pay this young woman a compliment or if she sincerely means it, says that, you know, she worries sometimes that they rob Jack of life experiences by not schooling him in the East either. I think the larger theme of that was, yes, you had elite schooling and this episode does a lot just in unspoken set deck and and background characters, the show is already setting up a theme that we see in modern Yellowstone in, in 2022 Yellowstone, this idea of the Eastern elites coming and the Western elites coming with their cars and their thoughts on the way country life should be clashing with the people of Montana who are there and doing it every day. You see it in when they're in Bozeman, that clash uh, that, again, is unspoken, but you see it here, too, in the way she's talking about it. You had all the schooling. You never learned how what this life is about. That was like a failing of your schooling. And she gives this great um, this great speech here, which I'm going to play, which I think is the theme of this episode. I think is the most important theme of this episode. Ranching life is hard and you have to be willing to give all for it. But I think is a theme of Yellowstone, the universe. Let's take a listen. You know, I admire you and, uh, and the opportunities you've had. I regret not sending Jack back east for school. I feel sometimes that we've robbed him of countless experiences, all of which you've had. But what you haven't had, however, is an education about this way of life. You'll miss more than weddings for cattle, my dear. If you give birth 
during calving season, it'll be a month before he sees his first child. If you give birth in the fall, it'll be even longer. You will stand knee deep in mud to help a sick foal. You will drive wagons through blizzards with hay for cattle and hear them screaming their gratitude when you approach. And you will be free in a way that most people can barely conceive. Now, if this is not the life you want, you must tell the boy now. Because you have to want more than the boy. You have to want the life, too. Because in this life, there's no debate in which is more important, the wedding or the cattle. It's always the cattle. What's more important, your life or the cattle's life? It's always the cattle. And I feel it's that way, you know, as a daughter of a of an entrepreneur, I feel like it's like if you own your own business, that's the story every time. Like it doesn't matter what's going on with the family. It doesn't matter what's going on. Like the business needs to be taken care of, especially if you have something like cattle, like live animals. You can't just put up the closed sign and walk away for a week, you know, like that's just not the way it works. And so I appreciated this is one of those things that have been complimented about shows like Bob's Burgers or or other programs where the, or even like success session where it's like business doesn't stop like you don't get to just like deal with your family like you have to deal with the business in conjunction with your family events and guess what the business is your livelihood so it's always got to come first i appreciated this entire thing and i was quite surprised actually that elizabeth's mother wouldn't have had that conversation with her like maybe elizabeth went off to school in the east and so she didn't live ranch life exactly but she came home she was going to marry a rancher no conversations had been happening. Like she's shocked that you know that like their their family business has come first. That seemed a little off to me. Right, and they they say that a couple of times in the episode. You know, Jacob says it to Carol when they're in bed. You know, she's the daughter of a rancher. It shouldn't be that much of a surprise. And Jack says it when he's before he's actually had the conversation with Elizabeth. He says it. You know, she's the daughter of a rancher. She under she she has to understand, even if she doesn't understand yet, she's going to learn to understand that this is this comes first. You know, I love love the bravado of a man who actually hasn't had a complicated uh, discussion with uh, his woman yet. <laughs> There's nothing like that bravado, that naive bravado. Um, and then you find yourself being told to go marry a cow and have a honeymoon on a mountain top. So that was pretty, that was pretty risque. Yeah, very so risque. Say. I mean, she had just shown some ankle at the time. I mean, I would, oof, grab my pearls and my smelling salts. That was not the time. She was not giving up any ankle for that. She was pissed, man. No way. I mean, going back to the immature and the naive thing. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I found this character a little bit annoying. I, I, <laughs> I because because he's so cocky to the point of it's the kind of cockiness that gets you killed. And in this brutal life, that kind of personality gets you killed because you think your shit doesn't stink. Well, that's when someone shoots you or that's when a bull gores you or that's when you find yourself in a position that you can't smirk and and smile your way out of. Right. It's the difference between like you were saying earlier, it's the difference between a Hollywood cowboy and a real been there, done that cowboy. And I think Jack is still has that summer, that summer do on him. You know, if, if Game of Thrones parlance, he's a sweet boy of summer. He hasn't had the hard life that Jacob has lived, that even that his father had to live through. Watch, imagine being John, his father, knowing that you had watched your mother be dead in a snowbank and on the verge of starvation yourself. This Jack has not experienced those things because of the hard work that's come before him. He's he's got some growing up to do himself and and Elizabeth even more so. For sure. I mean, it very much feels like when you have Jacob and then John and then Jack. I mean, Jack feels well covered like under their wings and but just sheltered. He's got this goofiness to him that is very accurate to a young man that age and and to being in young love and all that kind of stuff. Even when Elizabeth jumped off that carriage and she like kind of she just fell on her knees and everything, I was like, damn, that is like something that only a young kid could do. Yes. Yeah. I'm like thinking if I did that, I would just like roll over onto my back and be like, oh. I'll oh, even how they meet each other and twirl oh, around. Like, I never want to argue with you again. I never want to. That is, that's young love. And it's Mike, so. Could you imagine falling off of, a, like jumping off of a carriage onto your knees? 
it now takes me 15 minutes to get up out of bed to pee in the morning. I no. know, same. So I'm like, I feel like, oh my gosh, this is young, rubbery, your your fontanelle hasn't closed love kind of feeling. <laughs> Which I mean, I listen, I'm a grizzled old 45 year old man, uh, almost 45, 45, oh God, I'll be 45 in six weeks, you know, and, uh, you know, and I just want these kids to get off my lawn, you know, that's all I see when I see it. Like my heart is just dead and cold and I just Let's want them to get off my lawn. into that concept concept of like, get off my lawn because that is something actually in discussing this show I was talking with my dad now my dad is in real estate he's in land development there was a moment in this episode when they're like no one can own the grass the mountains own the grass and as a land developer's daughter my heart's like what are you talking about man can own the grass <laughs> We can own the land. Like, what are you talking about? And so there was like a whole like, I know this is a theme that, again, stretches across all of the different series that Taylor does of like, can you actually own nature? Can you can you stake a claim to something that is growing and has a life of its own? And I and I think that there will never be a right answer. It feels a little chicken in the egg. It feels like, you know, on one hand, I think. Yes, people can own it. But on the other hand, I think you have to have respect for it. You can't, I mean, you can't contain it, which is different than can you own it, right? Um, you can't control what's going to happen with it exactly, but you can own it. You can keep people off of it. You know, like that's a thing. You have to be so, a steward of it though, which as, is- This is what I'm saying. You right. have to respect it. I, right. That's why, I, that's how I'm saying like, you have to respect the land. You have to, you have to pay attention to what nature wants to do because you know old jurassic park teaches us you know nature finds a way so <laughs> it's going to end up biting you in the ass if you don't you know have the respect for the land but the whole concept that you can't own grass i was like that that my dad said then how could you ever have the line get off my lawn <laughs> right so we were like laughing because it was like everybody thinks they can own grass right this, like, this, is, this no. is i mean you're hitting on the question no and and, and listeners that may be why do they keep talking about the other shows just talk about 1923 because it's a fun you you'd be fundamentally missing a point of what taylor sheridan is trying to show here these patterns repeat no matter the year whether it's 1883 1923 or 2023 it's the same fucking conversations. And in Yellowstone in 2022, about to become 2023, they're talking about still owning the land and what you can't own the land. Summer, though, the Summer Higgins character played by Piper Parabo, her whole thing is as a, as a environmental radical terrorist is, you know, you, you, you can't own this land. It's, it's shameful that you have so much land. That's no different than what Banner is saying. Banner is saying in this episode, and it's interesting that this is a theme of Yellowstone, and I bring it up because it is a repeating pattern, and it is an ongoing discussion. I want to take you in the Wayback Machine, Caroline, and listen to this clip from Taylor Sheridan himself in character in 1883. Come across any barbed wire yet? Never heard of it. It's twisted steel wire with little bobs woven into it, sharp as a knife's tip. It is the one fence cattle will not push through. They're going to carve this country into little rectangles and fence them off. And just like that, two of our great pleasures are gone. That is what happened in this country. We did, and barbed wire is ever prescient. It is ever present in Yellowstone and in 1923. We see it in this episode. We see Banner having his men cut the barbed wire to run his sheep into the meadow ground, the, the mountain ground where ja, where Jacob and, and those ranchers are going to start pushing their cattle. Barbed wire. How many scenes in Yellowstone have we watched over the years of people having to go fix barbed wire? Yeah. Barbed wire is present. And, and this is 1883 being predicted. But we know that someone has to own the land. So I think you're right. I think it and ultimately comes down more to who's a steward of the land and how you're a steward of the land versus the actual concept of owning the land. See, and I would argue that being protective of not eating the grass down to the roots mm -hmm. so I was that just gonna things bring that up. could continue to grow and be respectful of like cycling out plots of land and moving your, your cattle or, or your sheep to different areas. 
I think that is extremely respectful. And I think that that is not actually in any way saying I own the land, I'll do whatever I want with it. And then going and like, you know, throwing a big bonfire on it or something. It's like, no, I don't want the vegetation to be killed permanently. So this is why we handle our land the way we do. Now, I don't know how you deal with that with sheep, frankly. I don't know how you don't constantly have your land be completely ruined if that's what you're raising. So this is a tough call. I don't know what those sheep herders are supposed to do. I mean, there should be a plan, right? <laughs> or you got to take right. them elsewhere. Well, I think I think I think the plan gets upended. The the whole apple cart gets upended when there is drought and locusts. A thousand percent. And obviously, like we said, like the entire market collapsed, you know, on what they thought they were doing and what the plan was and what was actually going to happen. Right. There should have been probably enough grass had a drought not come and killed it and make it inedible for for these things. But I mean, yeah, for sure. Sheep, I mean, sheep seem to be like an invasive species the way, you know, Jacob talks about them in this episode. But let's listen. Let's let's drill down a little bit more on stealing grass. Stealing a man's grass is like stealing his steers. You graze another man's lease again, and I'll have your whole flock, and I'm a man of my word. Stealing grass. Man doesn't own the grass. The mountains own the grass. God owns the grass. And you're no God, Jacob Dutton! You're no God! And if you didn't think I didn't uh, carve this out as an ongoing... Audio clip, you're insane. You're no God, Jacob Dutton! You're no God! So get ready to listen <laughs> to a whole... that more? Yeah, get ready to <laughs> have a season of that anytime Jacob steps out of line, so... No, and to be fair, you know, we have this Dutton crew who absolutely are, you know, our way or the highway, you know, or the train station, as it may be. Um, so, you know, when they say things like, you know, you're not a God, you're not above all this... I agree. They're not gods. They are not above all of this. And they certainly have set themselves above all of this. However, going back to just the nuts and bolts of grazing animals, you know, the the sheep owners didn't have a plan to where all the animals could be okay. They were like only looking out for their sheep. And when, you know, Jacob, Jacob explains, you're essentially killing the cattle. Just It's just taking longer. It's just going to be slow death because they won't have anything to eat. So not only are your sheep going to die once you eat to the roots, but now you're killing everyone else's property as well, all of their livestock. So... Like, what's your actual solution, sheep people? Because this isn't it. You're just killing everyone everywhere with what you're doing. And and taking more down with you is the main thing. Like, you can't just continue to take out other farms because your farming plan isn't working out. Like, that's not fair either. Well, let's let's switch over to Spencer. So World War One ends in 1918. We are in 1923. So we are five years now from the war ending. We learned through flashbacks that Spencer saw fighting. He was deep in the war. He seems to be having some kind of PTSD from it and also has not returned home to Montana, but has taken up a job somewhat of, uh, I was calling in my head as a big game exterminator. He seems to be a fur hire guide to eliminate big game who are otherwise harassing, you know, these high end safari customers who are being paid to see African nature without the threat of being mauled or killed. First thoughts on Spencer. What do you think about uh, Spencer? Quote, I have no destination, Dutton. <laughs> well, I, I immediately saw the comparisons between him and his father, you know, with being war veterans and having their PTSD dream nightmares and having to still deal with that. He seems incredibly brave and he seems much more skillful than what we see, like, say, in like Jack. Jack seems like, you know, a very um, young green man where Spencer seems very experienced. And I think like when we just talked about plans, like he's always got a plan. He is a drifter, but at the same time, like he's got these appears to be like contract jobs, right? To come into these different areas and take care of things as needed. So, I mean, he's definitely a thrill seeker. Um, he's the dreamer side, right? He's the one who's just like going to go out there and explore and do whatever he wants. He's definitely not going to be the one to settle down. I liked him as a character. I'm really interested in the African safari storyline and everything that's going there. So I'm hoping they keep him there 
a little bit longer. But I mean, I think that's without a doubt that he's coming home. It's just a matter of do we get to see a little more African safari or are we done with that? I, I think he has to come home because of the whole I have no destination. I mean, the, the foreshadowing is there throughout this episode. If Obviously, he will have a destination. His destination is Montana. This is all just treading water as he qu- maybe, quote unquote, finds himself or the part of himself that he lost, you know, to use Kara's letter parlance. My dearest Spencer, summer is here and with it a pestilence of locust and the plague of drought. Your uncle and brother and young Jack are pushing the herd into the mountains in hopes of finding greener grass there. We postpone Jack's wedding because, as you know, the herd comes first. When the house is full and the ranch is busy, I can lose myself in the hurry of it and forget you're not here. But the house is empty now and I've no chores left. And so I think of you. And wonder why. Why won't you come home to us? I can't help but think your absence is punishment. That somehow we are the reason you won't return. That's selfish, I suppose. War changes men, I know. I can only assume you are seeking the part of yourself you lost. And I can only pray that you find it and come back to us. I think he was my favorite character for sure of the pilot. I found him fascinating. He looks like a Dutton. He he feels like a Dutton. I think the similarities between him and Casey uh, Dutton in the future, obviously war vets, a war vets with PTSD, war vets with PTSD that are not comfortable being at home on the Dutton ranch that, that find themselves with a wanderlust that they need to go out and not be under the thumb of the family. There is a lot of similarities between Spencer and Casey. Also not being the oldest, being the younger brother. Lee Dutton was supposed to be the one to take over the Yellowstone Ranch, and he was killed. Spencer is not supposed to be the one to take over the Dutton Ranch. He's got an older brother, John, with his own family. Spencer is the younger brother who is supposed to be able to go out and and not be under the yoke of the Dutton Ranch. A lot of similarities between Casey and Spencer Dutton on the fact that I also think they look like each other. Genetically, I think there's a line between Tim McGraw, Spencer Dutton, and Luke Grimes. I really like this character. I really like the introduction to this character. I like that he's actively fighting demons. I appreciate his coffee intake. I was really getting down behind four shots of coffee one after another. I also like to pee out in the wild. I live up in the country. I think there's something very freeing about peeing out in nature. <laughs> Disgusting. I really, really identify with Spencer Dutton here. I really enjoyed this character and our introduction to him. And in the same way that Montana and and that whole world is a character unto itself, this African safari world was not was a character unto itself. And that's my desire for him to stick around there. And I think why he comes off as fascinating as he does is because the world that he's living in, the setting that he chooses to live his life is fascinating and and had so much going on. I mean, I was shocked that we had a death, you know, with the leopard and the woman and crazy that that leopard killed the woman. I did not Had her up that. in a fucking tree. Yeah. Didn't just kill her falls. in the bush. Yeah. He dragged, yeah. he took her body and sprang up into a yeah. tree with her. It was... It visceral. Wicked. It was yeah. unnecessary. I was telling Tom about it. I was like, there was a scene, Tom. I was like, I'm still scarred by it. He had her up in a fucking tree. Uh, Tom is my son. For those that don't listen to our other podcasts, you'll hear about him a lot because th- other than my cat, he's who I spend most of my time talking to. So uh, it was it was so visceral. And the way he was talking about it to, uh, I'm blanking on the character's name, the guy who hires him for the leopard hunt. He, he says to him, he's like, once they've got a taste for man, like they're not getting it up. It's very much much like yes he's going through some ptsd but there's also like this i'm testing my mortality over and over again i mean that opening scene where the lion lunges at him and he shoots him dead and then the lion lands on him i mean that's not for the faint of heart that is for someone who maybe has a slight death wish who maybe thinks back on his time in the war when he had a broken leg and had a fight hand-to-hand combat style who thinks that maybe I shouldn't have lived from that experience. And now I'm going to kind of constantly, I'm going to work through my trauma by constantly putting myself in, in the crosshairs of life. 
that's a fascinating psychological profile for us to get to see. And I like the fact that we're not just in, you know, doing nature porn in Montana, that we're getting a different setting. That's refreshing for Yellowstone viewers. Um, you know, we have seen the beauty of the American countryside for so many years now on the across the different shows. This is a different kind of beauty that we haven't gotten to see before. I think it's refreshing. So we touched on the residential schools and to a rain, rainwater. Um, I, I think there are a couple of interesting things here. One, one thing to understand about these that we didn't talk about before was that these were often run by Christian missionaries that were contracted by the federal government to run them. This is not just like a private Catholic school being set up to, to quote unquote, civilize these Native Americans. These were actual sanctioned institutions run by Christian missionaries to indoctrinate these people. I think that's a huge thing because it, when you have the government sanctioning this behavior it makes it even more egregious and when and what tiona goes through here and the conversation she has with her friend books b i believe her name is the character's name um in bed uh at nighttime when you know the friend's so funny she funny in an ironic way says you know you've got to heal up your legs how will a husband ever you know how will a man ever look at you to become a husband tiona's just thinking about trying to survive and, and introducing this idea of all those who have come through the school our family and friends that said they would write us and never have how do we know they're even alive that's terrifying imagine imagine going to bed at night and not wondering if your family and friends who used to go to school with you were killed the second they left as a legitimate fear because you have no proof that they're still alive after you've been tortured for an entire day I think that that's something that we have heard in stories where there's like actively war. I think that that's a story you've heard in World War II. And we can understand those stories of people getting snatched in the night and things happening and, you know, the, the poor treatment of everyone, the horrible treatment, the torture. It's completely feels foreign to be in Canada or or Montana, you know, that that's happening. That's the part I think that gets to be unnerving. It's not unusual to hear a story where people are wondering if their relatives lived or died. That's a story you and I have seen before. But in America, in, you know, with this group of people, this is like, okay, tell us more. Explain to us what happened. How did this happen? What was the structure? Who were the entities involved? And like you said, it's current day conversation. Like people are still trying to uncover and figure out what went on at these residential schools. That is remarkable that we still don't have full answers to this story even now. Uh, we still don't have answers. There's a fascinating aspect here. And, and we've talked a bit about owning the land and 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 Spencer talking about how it's kind of man versus beast and beast has a taste for man. But uh, the whole residential school storyline and Tiona's storyline introduces this idea of subjugating people. Again, this is a story you don't see often portrayed in television or in movies, but I want to play this clip from Father Renaud in the office this is before he starts to whip her after he has knuckled uh, Sister Mary. Um, I just want to play this clip. I understand your desire to lash out at a sister who lacks compassion, but you lash out. All will lash out. I have compassion for you, my child. I do. Place your hands on the shelves, please. I have compassion, but I have no mercy. If you lash out, all will lash out. That's the key sentence of that speech. And and the reasoning that this man, that this, this father, Renaud, is giving himself and everyone else for why they're treated the way they are. Because you need to be controlled. Because if I let you, this, this Sister Mary acted irrationally towards you and, and hurt you. But now I have to hurt you because if I let you get away with what you did to her, it will only encourage more, more disobedience and more uprisings. If you lash out, all will lash out. That is 
terrifying reasoning, right? I, that, 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 folk, think about that. What, what, before people get upset with this and this is, what is this? This is not entertaining. I don't understand what's going on here. We're talking about the frank subjugating and, and controlling of a whole race of people. Don't convince yourself it's anything else. This is not for Tiona and her family's benefits. This is not for some egalitarian reason or some philanthropic reason or some charitable reason. These are monsters who think that these these Native Americans need to be brought under the yoke and controlled. That's what he's saying here. That's fucked up. It is. It you know, as someone who covered Handmaid's Tale, though, it one hundred percent is just the prescribed method for breaking down a group of people and and creating you know whatever type of group you're looking for at that point, whatever it is you're wanting them to submit to. This is not the first time that this has been used like this. This is absolutely not the last time historically that this stuff has been used. So we've seen this um, happen in other areas. Again, it's just very unfamiliar to most people in our own country, they don't know the history. You know, we weren't, like you said at the beginning, we weren't taught the history of our country like this in school. So it, it's very, it's jarring. I think a lot of people, this could be the first time they're hearing about residential schools and the first time they're understanding how that culture was dismantled. And I think it is going to be extremely upsetting for a lot of people. And I'm curious to see how far they're going to go with it. You know, in 1883, we certainly saw that the pioneers endured so much there was so much death and illness and and destruction and like really their bodies just took on so much damage that i don't know how far taylor will go with all of this is this something that you feel like he could dial back the actual visual of it all or is it important that we see every laceration how how much does this story need to feel honest. I mean, I think you need this uh, just the way Taylor needs to start his shows with a bang. Think about the opening scene of the first episode of 1883. Think about the opening scene of this that we talked about with Kara bleeding from the head, shooting a man dead, screaming to the sky. The first impression you get is very important, I think, for Taylor when he's telling his stories. So my guess is this is graphically probably the worst we get, right? The, the actual living through the whipping and the bleeding and being told to mop up your own blood when you get dried out of the bath. All of that visually, my guess is that maybe this is the worst of it. I think thematically we're going to, I don't think Tiona's getting out of, you know, escaping the residential school next week. I, I think we're going to be in this tough to digest storyline for a while. I hope for my stomach's sake um, that it's visually, graphically the worst we get is in this episode. Um, but and it's important important yeah. for all of us who watch Yellowstone. I mean, obviously we know that Rainwaters exist in the future. And so, and we know her last name is Rainwater. So there is some hope there, I guess I want to say that, you know, she does make it out somehow out of here because, um, you know, we want to think that this lineage, you know, that's why they choose her, right? To follow is because we have seen future generations. Uh, I think it's also important to note, like, and this is a small thing and certainly not something that should feel like we should be giving so much compassion, but it was important to note the situation with the nun in that she felt like, yes, she was, she reminded me very much of Anne Dowd and in, in the in Handmaid's Tale of like, I have to do these things, but at the same time, there's higher ups that neither of us want to deal with. And so like, I'm still under other people's thumbs and I can be abused just as much as anyone else. There was that element that's layered in there that isn't going to get much notice, but I think it's fair to say, okay, they're, they are trying to show this hierarchy and they are trying to show that it's not just like one powerful entity taking down you know, another group. It's like there's these layers of people who are involved that may or may not have a say in their involvement. Right. Well, we've had this conversation, I feel like, across so many different shows, this idea of like hurt people, hurt people, you know, and and lashing out. And, and is it? Well, in and I'm even going a step further and saying that the idea that she doesn't have a choice either. 
I think that's important to know and not gloss over because it's like you, there's this assumption that every single person who commits any type of violence against another had the choice to whether or not to do that. And I'm saying that there's some layer of, yes, she she's too much. She's taking it too far and everything is happening. And also she's got this leadership above her who is just as abusive a rough storyline a rough storyline an important storyline i'm curious to see where it goes the fact that we know in the trailer she's introduced as rainwater as tiona rainwater and 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 credits credit her as tiona rainwater they actually didn't say rainwater in this episode that makes her an ancestor of thomas rainwater someone who is of the reservation the broken broken rock reservation confederation tribe but we know didn't really spend his formative years there he would be one east for schooling kind of like elizabeth strafford and came back um that that's thomas rainwater and yellowstone's story this is an ancestor a great grandmother grandmother who knows an aunt who knows at this point but when people ask why is angela blue thunder why is thomas rainwater so angry and 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 their position that they take in yellowstone well guys you're seeing it this is recent history. It really is in the grand scheme of things. And even more so for them, this is this is what their life was like. So why are they so angry? Why do they push back against John Dutton and the government and the taking of our land and this was ours? Monica, who gets so much hate from fans in Yellowstone, um, talks about, you know, this was our land before it was theirs. I played the clip, you know, seven generations. We're going to want this land back. Why? Why are they so angry? Well, look what they were subjugated to. Look what they were put through. Look what, what they were made to suffer through. Wouldn't you be angry if this was your grandmother or your great grandmother? I would be. I would be. It, it's absolutely tragic. And the amount of culture and everything that we lost to that, you know, is just terrible. Like, it's hard to wrap your brain around what America would look like had we just coexisted and not decided to dismantle their world. I am interested in this story. I'm hesitant about how the story will unfold. Um, I am not somebody who really can take a lot of abuse on the screen. Like this is, that's it's very difficult for me to enjoy that as entertainment in any way. Um, so I'm curious if they're going to get a little bit more complex, I guess I want to say, as opposed to just, you know, putting the camera directly on someone's leg and, and making it bleed. Like, will they do more to explain the abuses, especially like, say, the psychological or the unraveling of the culture? Like, like there's something in that that isn't about whipping someone that is very interesting to tell as a story, especially how you approach it. When Tiona in the classroom curses, presumably curses out the sister in her native tongue, the way it triggers the nun and yells at her like to not speak in the god in her godless tongue. That's a real thing. Part of part of this westernization, part of this quote unquote civilization was the rejection of their native language and not being able to use it. And so I thought it was another, again a little detail that was like this was a this was a 360 degree torture and and brainwashing and indoctrination system this wasn't just like start wearing blue jeans and putting hairspray in your hair this was reject everything that's in your genetic code and live the way we tell you to which is foreign against almost every impulse you have that's a lot to fucking take. That's a lot to digest. That's a lot for Di Tiona to digest. And I think it's going to be a lot for us, the viewers, to have to watch. But this is the part of the show where I think it's not so much about entertaining us uh, versus more about educating us uh, and in stories that maybe we don't hear every day as well as entertain us and you know being viewers who are uncomfortable you know let hopefully that means we're growing right that we're we're seeing new things we're understanding new things and we're having some compassion for characters and in that hopefully that carries over right into real life and 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 what we understand about history and why certain groups are where they are in the world right now as we go to wrap up here, let's hit a couple of lightning round things. There are a couple of characters that had actually some speaking roles here, but I don't know that we have a great feel for them, but I'm curious if you had any first impressions. You have Jerome Flynn, uh, Braun, who, who was great as Braun in Game of Thrones. Uh, Jerome Flynn is playing Banner Creighton here, the sheep herder, who is the antagonist of this episode. Any, any first impressions on this character or what you would like to see here? Do you think he even makes it out alive for running sheep? <laughs> 
it doesn't feel like he should make it out alive. It feels like this is one of those things where, you know, he goes down with the ship. But I think he did a great job of trying to explain the plight of, you know, his group of sheep herders and what they're going through. I, I felt for them. I didn't have an answer for them. He, I, no, I don't know. Just say like he's fucked, but <laughs> oh, no, I, th- I think he, I think he have to imagine he's pretty fucked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just no, there's like no good answer for him. There really isn't, you know, I mean, I appreciated the, the part where when Jacob says, why don't you just sell some of your sheep? You know? And it was like, to who? Like, I mean, it, there was, they did a good job through the dialogue of explaining that he had very little options. Everything was going to be like a makeshift. Let's just hope this works kind of thing but no matter what they were going to have to go sneak on some other people's land they were going to have to the scottish versus irish ethnic strife that's also introduced in this episode is interesting because that's again not something you really ever see i think as in 2022 america we think uh i I think a lot of us larger think of as the scots and irish as brethren uh and and not really strifing against each other It, it it was an interesting you know, th- this is a st- this is a story of immigrants. You know, we don't think of the Dumb- Duttons as an immigrant family, but this show very much uh, uh, listen to the trailers uh, where Elsa narrates the trailers. You know, from the Scottish Highlands to the slums of Dublin. You know, I, I mean, this is a story of immigrants. This is a story of of immigrant Scots b- but butting up against immigrant Irish in what should feel like limitless land, but in fact has barbed wires dividing the land, and they're running head into each other it it was it was interesting to me because i don't know how much they're going to emphasize it but this show or taylor sheridan has never been one to really do ethnic strife amongst each other other than native americans against the quote-unquote white man it's not true in 1883 that was a whole thing because at the beginning we were like are these immigrants all from the same place and we were like wait they're really not they're all speaking different languages they're quick to clear up like we're not buddies we come from different places with different you know languages and different customs and everything and definitely that played into their skill set so it, it's great because it make it's like pre melting pot, right? It's like before we all just were like, yeah, everybody's got Irish and English and whatever in them, right? <laughs> like, right? Like that's for for all of you, not me, because I'm Lithuanian, hundred percent. But for the rest of you who are not and all mixed together, there's all different stuff that that we take for granted. Like you said, Scottish, Irish, whatever. But at, there was a time when. That's not true, you know. We are introduced to Zane Davis. I guess every every age needs its own rip. And uh, we're introduced to Zane Davis, who is this era's ranch foreman. He is he is 1923's rip. Maybe not as burly, but job wise, it seems to be the same job role. The guy who's actually running the ranch in the day to day kind of uh, aspects of it, the way Rip does on Modern Yellowstone. Played by uh, Brian Garrity. He seems very respectful. He seems very kind of committed to the family. I don't know that we have a good feel for him, but I mean, I think any kind of running the ranch character probably is going to get some screen time and maybe some backstory. So it'd be interesting to learn more a little bit about Zane. And Zane is such an interesting name for 1923. Um, I, I think of Billy Zane from Titanic, but uh, yeah. It seems very edgy for that time. Uh, and you got Robert Patrick. I mean, Robert Patrick, when he was announced as casting, I think people really turned their heads. Um, this is this is another kind of big name actor, and he's playing Sheriff McDowell here. Again, I don't have a, other than being loyal, seemingly to Jacob Dutton, and and I want I don't want to say in the pocket of, but buddy buddy cozy with Jacob Dutton. I don't really have a good feel for what this character's role is going to be. I mean, we've had sheriffs before in Yellowstone. Obviously, I'm thinking of Donnie in Yellowstone. Um, James Dutton goes on to become a sheriff of sorts back in 1893. I'm curious how this sheriff is going to run interference for the Duttons. Presumably, he's an ally when it comes up against war between the sheep herders and the Livestock Commission and the cattle aspect of the Livestock Commission. I'm curious, though. Hey, Mike, can I give you a little factoid? Two seconds ago, I said Zane's not a biblical name, but in fact, it is. It is the Hebrew version of guess what name? John. Yep. It's got to be a J name. That's the only one. <laughs> Taylor's baby so book of names really only has a, J names. So Zane is really just a Hebrew name for John. Yeah. There you go. Clever. 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 Taylor. Oh, Taylor. You're Zane. Oh. <laughs> We're going to go back in and be like, do you know what Emma is? 
It's just another name for John. <laughs> That's it. Well, let's talk about, we didn't really talk about, I mean, strong women working the ranch. I, I like the fact that they threw that scene in of Kara, who is an older woman, and Emma kind of busting their ass while Elizabeth is not there. She's not bailing hay. She's not mucking stalls. She's inside crying as they head away on the ranch. But then we see Kara and Emma out there doing the work and maintaining the ranch. I like when Taylor gives us strong women. You know, I feel like ever every era has its age i like that we get to see them actually doing the work and uh, I, you know I'm, I'm hesitant to speak too much about the importance of strong women on screen but i think it's something that we still can always see more of curious if it resonated with you watching them do the work while the men were away i think it underscores how capable they are and how absolutely uh, knowledgeable and you know they have the experience to be able to get the job done too it just speaks to the fact that this this is their way of life. This is not an event that's happening in their life. This is their life. And that for me was was well done in this entire episode. I really believed that these people eat, drink, breathe cattle ranching. And and that can be difficult, especially again going back to the casting. Helen Mirren you don't just automatically assume an American ranch, you know? So you have to do a lot to make that look right. And they did it. They did. They were very successful, I thought. I had to get the clip of Helen. I have to isolate the clip of Helen saying, okay, Jacob. I have to get the I clip know. of that. It was so it was, flat and funny. It was I, so I, funny. I dug it. That was such a dry response. <laughs> okay, Jacob. <laughs> uh, at the end of 1923, and I'm talking about the very end, the last card of the credits, you know, it's the scene where they say, the unions that are involved in the show and the fact that no animals were harmed in the making of this and that in this show that animals were monitored by the different groups that very last that that card of the credits had this quote at the top of it 1923 is inspired by the places events and people who battled the american west in 1923 now that's in place of this show is a work of fiction not based on anyone any coincidences to anyone living or dead is purely coincidental this is what they said in basically in place of that i thought that was interesting i, I thought that was an interesting little quote to throw there at the very end of this episode where most people are not going to see it but I think is a testament to Taylor telling us through words, indeed, through like the rainwater star, the storyline, the residential school storyline, that it's not all pretty. But these are these are real people or these are characters based on real people and real shit that they did and had to go through and suffer through. So. so in the Taylor universe, I think he's done a great job now with this new 1923 of maintaining that he's going to tell an honest, brutal, gritty story about what was going on during that time period. And as viewers, some things we're going to watch between our fingers, right? Peeping out being like, oh, this is really, really a harsh life. Yeah. But I came away from 1883 having a huge respect for the bravery, the courage, the grit that that our you know forefathers had to be able to create the world that they did. And also really having some eye-opening moments of like who was trying to do that and who got the short end of the stick during all of that. What did that all look like? I think that 1923 is going to do an amazing job of continuing that story and keeping us hooked. One of the things, one of the reasons when you originally this show, for people who don't know, originally this show, when it was announced right after 1883 ended, was announced as 1932. And then a couple months later, it was announced that they were renaming it 1923 um, because they wanted to back it up so that they could show what life was like in the American West during the 20s, which is a period that prohibition um, is a part of and we see the prohibition activists the temperance movement is in full effect they're standing outside the quote-unquote soda shop which is a funny fact if you look into prohibition and the, and the timing of prohibition soda shops i'm using air quotes uh were one of the fronts for places where you could get a drink um so again i thought it was a nice little detail i'm curious what you thought i want to go back to prohibition for a second just give some facts on prohibition i'm curious what you thought of bozeman in 1923 i feel like bozeman is a city we see in yellowstone lord knows we've seen that door to the livestock montana livestock commission so many times i know but i'm curious what your impression of of bozeman in 1923 was 
It seemed familiar. I think because we covered Westworld, it seemed very familiar. Again, though, that scene when all of them are riding up, it also a little bit reminded me of 1883. Remember when all of them ride up at once? Because I want to say it was LaMonica Garrett maybe that told us that he actually was going to blow up that picture of like all of them coming into town. There was like that moment too in this one where, you know, you had all of the of the ranchers coming in like like one movement. Watching all of that happen felt very Westworldy to me, very, you know, I don't know, saloons and old right. fashioned, you know, Western town kind of thing. It was like Sweetwater it mashed up against Temperance was what I put in my notes. Like it was yeah. the Roaring Twenties City matched with the original Old West City. Because that yeah. was because that's what it is, right? It's the blending. If you listen to the La Monica Garrett with the the elitist e, the eastern elites coming with their cars into the town and stuff. Like that's where you're seeing that that melting popping kind of forced together. You know, you and I cover the Gilded Age. And I feel like for that one too, there was that feel of old world mixing with new world and mm-hmm. the, and the, in the really, you could look at it like, wow, progress. Like, look at this. They're coming to the city and this is great. There's all this stuff. But because in both Gilded Age and in this one, we have so many characters that are on the old school, traditional, I don't want change side of things. It's very like, foreboding you know it's like yeah there's a car and it's like there's a car you know like in a they're gonna wreck everything kind of way not in there's a car wow how exciting and innovative and you know look at this town growing and prospering it's like no not a car you know you get that vibe of like nothing good could happen with progress in this town the rock upon which progress will bash and not advance Exactly. Montana has never been very open. Montana in the Sheridan universe has never been very open to progress. Or at least the Duttons, right? Or, yes. The Duttons as a group are like crash upon me progress. Seeing, right? seeing that Jacob is the Montana Livestock Commissioner made me think, has there ever been a commissioner in Montana in this world that wasn't a Dutton? It almost feels like a rite of passage the way we have seen that role play. And almost like the Duttons like created it, it feels right. like in some way, you know, like that they had a hand in actually organizing the structure in which Montana grew and developed. Which is and, interesting. And, yeah. Because if you look, remember that scene in 1883 where they come across uh, uh, James Dutton and his uh, sidekicks, uh, Shay and Thomas, they, they come across livestock commissioners. And remember, they were bad guys. They were horse thieves uh, that had stolen some of the group's horses. And and, and and just in the brief time that we spent with those livestock commissioners, they were depicted as villains. So it's interesting now contrasting that, that the Duttons, the way the Duttons run the Montana Livestock Commission is is heroic in the telling of the story of in which the Duttons are the center of. Yes, they use the Livestock Commission as a way to shape Montana life and their life and protect it and use the law and becoming agents of the state and law enforcement agents of the state in order to carry out their will. And there are other families, obviously other ranching families we'll learn about the Straffords, right? Elizabeth's family is a ranching family. I think there are some other names introduced in this episode, but really the Duttons use the Livestock Commission to protect their way of life. And if there are other families that benefit from it, fine. But it's interesting that they have this whole carved out aspect of law enforcement that they really wield for their own purposes. It, it's a fascinating thing because it does call into question the abuse of government for own purposes. And is it is it heroic? I mean, doesn't that make them bad guys? Doesn't that make them villains? This is a question that I think a lot of people ask from time to time in the Yellowstone universe. Are the Duttons actual villains in the story or not? Everybody's got a reason, right? In this entire series, in in the entire universe, like in the Yellowstone episode that played when this one came out, there were things that they were doing that was being frowned upon. But then it was like reasons, and people were like, "Oh, it's better for the cattle if they do that." Right. If you don't take the time to educate yourself on the way of life, then it's very hard to stand outside and point fingers about who's the villain and who's the whatever. Like, there's absolutely injustice. That happens. There's absolutely parts where having seen 1883, you and I, I think, have a great respect for what they fought for and how difficult it was to get there. We have that backstory. Whereas if you just start watching 1923, you're like, this is no fair. Why did that guy just get to make his own bad 
judge. And it's like, go back and watch 1883 and see what he went through to get there, you know? Right. And then maybe you have like a better idea that it wasn't just like someone showed up one day and said, I'm the boss. They, you know, scratched and fought and clawed their way to get there. And then this is what happened for good or for bad. Some people can say, well, that's not admirable. But we watched 1883 and it was a difficult arduous journey right when jacob dutton says to banner during that meeting my family fought for what we have and do you want to fight me too i don't think so i i cut this clip but he actually goes on to say if you wanted more land you should at least more land you know this idea of the duttons right the duttons fought scratched and clawed everything that they have and anyone else could have done the same the Duttons just happened to do it. They did the work. So why should someone else get to partake in that or get a piece it's of that? It's difficult because then you go over to the residential school and you say, yeah, but, you know, and you kind of point. Yeah. And you're like, uh, so this is going to be a complex theme that we're right. going to talk about. And I, I know for a fact in at the end of 1923, we will not land on a specific answer that's going to make everyone feel like, yep, that's how I saw it. There's definitely going to be parts to this that we're going to say, well, that was a good decision. That was shitty. That was good. That was shitty. But it's just going to be like a episode by episode. How did this actually play out? And could they have done better? Did they have the knowledge and the information, the skill set or the ability because of just plain survival to make a different choice? Yeah, I, I keep coming back to that conversation between and this is again another Yellowstone, you know, reference, but Monica and Summer going through the cemetery a couple of weeks ago and Summer realizing, looking at Margaret James and Elsa's graves and saying, man, they've been here for that long. And Monica's like, yeah, they've been here that long, but it was my family's land before it was theirs. And, you know, we played that paradise clip from, from 1883, where the, the Native American chief basically says, there's land there. You can go, you know, take your family there and build your paradise there. But in seven generations, we're going to want that land back. And by the way, that clip also says, like, we may come onto your land to hunt from time to time. Like, don't give us like any bullshit. Like, there was an understanding of the stewardship of the land at some point, but. You know, but the more people come in, the, that message gets lost. That agreement, that hand, that spit handshake lesson gets lost. Um, and I mean, who would have told them? Who would have been the ones to tell Jacob and Kara what the deal was? It would have had to have been the little boys, the half dead little boys that they find would have had to be the ones to say, hey, BT dubs. Uh, when dad took this land, he said seven generations, you know, like there, who would have been there to tell the story, you know? That's important, right? I think you know that. That's your Hamilton cue there. Who who lives, who dies, who tells their story. I mean, it, it tells their story. Who's the one? Well, yep. Um, uh, before we go, we were literally at the end of the episode. I just want to talk a little bit about, about prohibition, only because Montana has an interesting place in the prohibition story. Um, so I'm going to read here a little bit, and then we're going to say goodbye. So, 18th Amendment. That's the Prohibition Amendment was ratified in 1919. Prohibition goes into effect in the United States as a federal amendment to the Constitution in 1920. Uh, it was put into place by the a lot of people know it as the Volstead Act. Uh, it was actually called the National Prohibition Act. Montana was actually an early adopter of prohibition they signed a temperance law montana did in 1916 which went into effect in 1918 in montana so montana was living under prohibition laws for a couple of years before the whole country was um we hear about the women's christians temperance movement in this episode jacob says when he crawls into bed with Kara, expect a letter from the temperance uh, from the temperance movement like that's who he's talking about those women who are standing at the soda shop in the beginning of the episode those women, along with actually farmers and rural uh, people who lived out in the rural areas, were the big proponents of prohibition. Um, for all the reasons that you could think of, that the idea that alcohol was of the devil and it promoted obscenity and, and a de degradation of moral values. Um, soda shops were a popular bootleg place like we see in the show. The interesting thing, though, is that the 21st Amendment, which repeals prohibition, doesn't actually come into effect until 1933. Montana 
again, an early adopter of prohibition a couple of years beforehand, actually repealed prohibition in 1926. They stopped they stopped enforcing the prohibition laws in Montana in 1926, five years, seven years, seven years um, before it actually was outlawed. So they were an early adopter of prohibition and then an early abandoner of prohibition. I just thought that was like a funny little timeline. Montana, always on the forefront for good or bad. <laughs> right, right. When you said that, it made me it made me have this moment of being like, you know, like nothing good happens after 2 a.m. kind of thing. It kind of made me feel like that, like, like what would be the rural farmer's argument? He'd be like, nothing good happens in a saloon. Nothing good happens at a bar. Like, you know, like go to bed, take care of your animals. You know? Well, again, look at Yellow, look at Yellowstone, which gives us a lot of history. The bunkhouse boys are always up to shit at nighttime and it always involves alcohol, whether they're playing drinking and drinking and playing poker in the middle of a bull ring or they're, they're having people arrested because they just beat up a bar and and trashed it they let a they but let a bull loose in a bar everyone remember that like this is why we needed temperance laws folks the bunk cowboys and their shenanigans so that's funny that's very funny i'm sure we're going to see more of all of that and i'm sure you're going to drop us some extra good facts as we continue our journey we still have seven more episodes with you guys in 1923 please go over and check out yellowstone because there's tons of good stuff happening over there too i know we have a little bit of a break right like there's like we have an episode or two, and then we have a little, a little break action going on over in Yellowstone. So there's you kind of have to check out to see what nights that your shows are coming on these days, huh? Yeah, yeah. If you check out the uh, Facebook group, which I think you gave a little tip at the beginning, it's the Yellowstone 1923, 1883, and four sixes discussion and news group. I always try and put up timely scheduling things because both shows are running at the same time. Um, so definitely subscribe there and you know join in the conversation on these shows. This is Caroline. And this is Mike. Thank you for listening to the Yellowstone Podcast 1923 edition. If you wouldn't mind heading over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode, that would be appreciated. Even more appreciated while you're there, if you could leave us a five-star review, it helps in promotion of the show, it helps other people find the show, and we would, uh, you know, really appreciate it so that we don't die frozen in a snowdrift. R.I.P. Margaret. Thanks for listening. Margaret. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you.